This is the 22nd lecture for MA 1012. In this lecture, we'll cover second order linear ordinary differential equations. First, let's figure out what those are. So a differential equation means some kind of relationship between uh, a function. Well, let's say we could have f equals g of. Uh, it should involve the uh, variable x and then the value of some function of x. So y is y of x, some function. And this side could involve y as well, the left and the right hand side. And it could involve a derivative and so on up to some number of derivatives. Um, so it involves the, the value of the variable x, possibly the value of y, some function of x, a value of derivative of y, and so on and so on and so forth. And the left and right hand sides can both have those in them. And we'll only go up to some finite number of derivatives. For us, we're only interested in second order equations. So for us, we'll only allow up to two derivatives. And we can have the same sort of expression on the other side. So an expression like this. And what we're really looking for is a kind of law that some function should satisfy. We're told that a function y, an unknown function y, satisfies some sort of law like this. But the unknown is not a number. It's an unknown function. And that's what makes the theory of ordinary differential equations, the theory of differential equations, very, very different from calculus. In calculus, we're usually looking for a number. The unknown is usually some number which we're trying to find. In differential equations, the unknown is an unknown function, and all we know about it is that it satisfies some sort of rule. Um, so, as simple examples, uh, we could have things like the second derivative of an unknown function is equal to the sine of x, or the second derivative of an unknown function uh, plus x times y squared is equal to e to the x squared. Or we could have um, something like the second derivative squared uh, plus e to the x times the first derivative uh, is equal to the natural log of x squared plus 1. Uh, for example, um, those are second order ordinary differential equations because they give us a law that relates what the second derivative uh, should, how the second derivative should relate to the other uh, variables. Um, so the second derivative, x, and value of y, and possibly value of the first derivative, those are allowed and nothing else. We have to make some law that, that we're writing down some law that, 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 that that's supposed to be satisfied by some unknown function, y. Um, we're going to be interested in the simplest examples. That's one of the reasons why we're sticking with second derivatives. We want to deal only with very simple examples. So we don't allow third or higher derivatives in these expressions. And we want uh, linear uh, second order. Uh, differential equations. Uh, why linear? Because generally they're easier to understand than the nonlinear ones. So they look like this. All right, for some uh, some functions, which will be given to us. So be given. They're known, uh, usually when the, these sorts of problems, we're given known functions p, q, r, and f. And we're supposed to try and find the unknown is y equals y of x function. We don't know what function it is that satisfies this differential equation, and we want to find it. So a linear equation looks like that. It means This means that it doesn't have, for example, any y squareds in it, or any the, the, this thing can't be squared. This is nonlinear. It's nonlinear because it involves a square of a derivative of the second derivative. Um, so you're not allowed to have those kinds of things. This is not allowed as a linear equation because it has a y squared in it. It's not allowed because it's nonlinear in y. Uh, the linear differential equation has to be linear in this guy, in the second derivative, linear in the first derivative, and linear in the y. It doesn't have to be linear in x. It can have x squareds or cosine x's or whatever it likes over here. But each thing that's multiplied, and it doesn't have to be linear in r of x, that could be cosine of x squared, that's fine. But it has to be linear in y, derivative of y, second derivative of y. Um, for example, if we look at simple cases, um, uh, we're allowed, um, the first one we 
we gave as an example before was this one. That's allowed because it's not linear in x, but that's okay. It only has to be linear in the y value, the derivative of y value, and the second derivative value. Um, so that's an example of a linear one. We can make much more complicated linear ones. Um, we could make, for example, something like second derivative 1 over x um, plus uh, derivative, let's say, cos of x cubed times first derivative um, plus e to the x times y equals 10x is allowed. It's got complicated functions of x involved in it, which aren't linear, but it only linearly affects the second derivative, the first derivative, and the value. The linear equations have a somewhat more satisfying theory than the nonlinear ones. There's a lot more known about the analysis of the linear equations, although it is true that, in general, we don't know how to solve them. The general second-order linear equation, if I don't know something special about the p's, q's, r's, and f's, then, in general, we don't know how to solve this equation. It's already too difficult to solve. And obviously, the nonlinear equations are even worse, um, even less likely to be able to find ones we can solve. Now we want to find a, our first distinction between different classes of differential equations will be between those which are uh, homogeneous and inhomogeneous. So for given linear equations, where they look like this, uh, p times second derivative, q times first derivative, r times, uh, sorry, r times the value, no derivatives, um, uh, is equal to f of x. Uh, if this f of x is everywhere, zero, just the zero function, then the equation is said to be homogeneous. And the homogeneous ones are, are, are going to be, for us, rather special. But uh, we get a nice theorem about the relationship between inhomogeneous and, and homogeneous. Um, the theorem is simply that if we have a Let's call this equation star. Star um, uh, has an associated homogeneous. It's associated homogeneous equation, which is exactly the same equation, but shut off the the, the f term. So, um, so let's write it again. But now, as the homogeneous equation, so we have the same left-hand side. But now instead of f, we set it to 0. Let's call the associated homogeneous. They have different answers. They're different equations. They have different solutions. But if I want to know something about this one, it often helps to reduce to trying to solve this one. If we solve the homogeneous one, it can help us to solve the inhomogeneous. And in fact, the result is that um, is simply that um, the homogeneous, uh, uh, so the solutions, um, of the homogeneous um, add up to make more solutions. You take two solutions, you add them, you make another solution. So you can add solutions. Uh, and scaling a solution of a homogeneous uh, makes a solution. So those are facts about the homogeneous, that you can add solutions to solutions and get more solutions. And you can scale solutions and get solutions. So that's the first fact, which is useful here. And the second is that, um, it, which is that, is that if, we have, um, if we have one solution of the inhomogeneous, if y1 solves uh, the inhomogeneous, Uh, this star equation that I wrote above, and y uh, two solves, or sorry, y zero solves uh, the associated uh, the associated um, uh, homogeneous equation. Then um, y one plus y naught solves the inhomogeneous. Uh, homogeneous. So it's enough to solve um, 
uh, the to solve uh, one to find one solution of the um, of the inhomogeneous. Um, in other words, another way to say it is that that so all of the solutions of the uh, inhomogeneous. The solutions of the inhomogeneous are exactly uh, y1 plus y0, where uh, y1 is any one, you just define one solution of the inhomogeneous. And y0 can uh, vary among among all. You need to know all solutions of the, I'll just write homog, the homogeneous. Um, so, uh, so what we need to do, in other words, to solve an inhomogeneous equation is to find one solution of it, and then after that we just have to solve the, the homogeneous, which is supposed to be easier. That's the idea. So we'll find one solution of the inhomogeneous, and after that we'll just start adding on to it any solutions of the homogeneous. Okay, so uh, so this is sort of almost obvious because the uh, the one solution of the of the inhomogeneous gives us the inhomogeneity, the f of x term on the on the on the right hand side, and then after that these solutions of the inhomogeneous put a zero term on that side, and so they don't change it. So it's very straightforward to see why this is true. And so it means that if we want to solve um, an inhomogeneous guy, find one solution of it. I don't know where we get that from, but somewhere, hopefully. And then after that, we reduce to a homogeneous problem. So it's a make, it makes it easier to, 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 to see how to find the general solution. Now, we might wonder how many solutions are there to one, to one of these sorts of equations. And um, there's a rough uh, dimension count that we can make that we could justify. Um, so, uh, for a for a, a second order uh, differential equation, uh, what do we expect? We expect uh, uh, to uh, integrate twice. It isn't true that you can actually solve them by by computing integrals. It turns out that that doesn't work. Even for linear equations, you can't just do integrals to solve them. But you still still expect that if you could somehow do integrals twice, you'd integrate twice. Um, so you expect two constants of integration. So you expect two constants worth of solutions. And while that's certainly not a rigorous argument, because as I said, you can't actually solve them by integrating, it does give the right count. It does give the right count that, generally speaking, we'd expect there to be two uh, solutions, two uh, parameters worth of solutions. Um, so what we'd expect, um, so we expect that uh, there is exactly one solution a unique solution satisfying some y equals y naught and derivative of y with regard to x is equal to some v naught at a given x equal to x naught. And something like that can be proven under reasonable hypotheses, which we won't make precise. The rough idea, though, is that you'd expect that there should be uh, a family of solutions given by you get when well, somebody tells you where to work it, which x not to work it. Look, you look, look looks like we've got three three constants here, but you can pick any x not at all. And then once you've picked that particular x not, you can specify all the solutions. All the different solutions are are are, are specified by different values of the y not and the v not. So um, it's really two constants worth of solutions because you pick the at a particular x not, and then you start specifying I want this x not. Um, and then I'm going to specify a value for the y and a value for the derivative dy dt. And then there'll be one and only one solution through here. So you get to specify really two pieces of data, the y value to start at and the, and the derivative of y. And if you vary that data at this one fixed x, you get all through all the solutions. So that's the, the way to think of parameterizing them, that you parameterize the, the height y and the, the derivative, the slope uh, v naught, at a particular uh, value of x naught, and you can specify them pretty much arbitrarily, and you should get one and only one solution. And that's roughly correct under reasonable hypotheses. 
So we've discussed some generalities about these equations, but we really don't have any examples yet where we can solve them um, explicitly. So what we'd like to be able to do is to solve some of them. Um, so some simple examples uh, are the homogeneous um, homogeneous linear uh, constant coefficient. Um, those are the ones that look like the, all the all of the functions in the equation just being constant. And with a zero, it's homogeneous, so it's got a zero on this side. And then all the other quantities are just constants. For this thing, we can write down an explicit solution. Um, it might be uh, nice also to allow ourselves to use the notation a y prime prime plus b y prime plus c y equals c, c y equals zero. Um, either notation, of course, the the same thing. Second derivative could be written either way. Um, now, one way to approach this problem is simply to guess that uh, we might try our favorite function. The most beautiful function in mathematics is the exponential function. Um, so let's just try that. Um, let's try an exponential function. Because I know how to take its derivative, so I like that. Um, and it will turn out to work. Um, so we'll pull down, well, more or less, it will sort of turn out to work. Let's see what happens. Um, I pull down the exponent when I, when I differentiate. When I differentiate again, I pull down the exponent again. Now let's see what happens if we pack that together, put it into here, and see what, what we come up with. Um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, what we come up with is simply that um, if we have, so we had a y prime prime plus b y prime plus c y is 0. We had y is e to the m x. So y prime was m e to the m x. Y prime prime was m squared e to the m x. You can see what's happening. We're multiplying by m every time we differentiate. Every derivative makes another factor m come down. And that means this equation turns into a times second derivative is, has an m squared in front, b times first derivative is an m in front, and c, and the, this has a 1 in front. And then all the remaining uh, factors are, there's a factor of an exponential, an exponential, and an exponential. The same exponential in each one. So I'll put all those exponential factors together. I'll just factor them out over here. And that has to equal 0. So that's what we get when we plug y equals e to the mx for some unknown m. m here again is the unknown. Uh, that I might try to solve for. We don't really know if that's going to work. We don't know if the solutions will turn out to look like this. They might or they might not. And it turns out they don't always look like this. But let's see what happens. Um, so we have an unknown value of a, of a variable m. And we try to see if plugging that into our differential equation could come up with a solution. We've calculated out the derivatives and plugged them in. Every time we differentiate, we pull down another factor of m. So we have no m's, 1m, 2m's. Um, and then every one has an exponential e to the mx in it. So when we plug y in here, we put y prime prime in here, y prime in here, y in here. We plug them all in. Each one creates a factor of e to the mx. We factor those out to this side, and then we've got this in the front. Now, something wonderful happens. Um, the exponential can't be 0. We have to get 0 on this side, but there's no way you can get a 0 out of an exponential, so you can just divide it off. Uh, exponentials are never zero. So we can divide that off from both sides and simply get the equation am squared plus bm plus, oh sorry, that should be c, um, plus c equals zero. A quadratic equation in an unknown variable m. And this is called the auxiliary equation. It has various other names, uh, but we'll call it the auxiliary equation, which is a common name for it. Um, so what we've done is to start here. This was the beginning, our original problem. Solve this differential equation. What we found is that we could solve it if we could solve this dif this non-differential equation, this this algebraic equation in m. And of course, we know the solution is that m is negative b plus or minus square root b squared minus 4ac over 2a does the job. So that means that we can actually find this. And if we if we get a plus and a minus, which are actually different from one another, if this is not 0, we get a plus and we'll get a minus, giving us two different values of m, giving us two different solutions. And we said that there should be a two-parameter space of solutions. So it's a linear equation. Any, any two solutions, we can take their constant combinations, constant linear combinations. So as long as we can find two different solutions, we'll be fine. 
So that'll that'll do it. So what we find is that if b squared minus 4ac is not zero, we get uh, two uh, different solutions this way. Um, y equals e to the mx, m equals m1, m2, the two roots of this quadratic equation given by the quadratic formula, and then um, the general solution, we'll find all the solutions, the general solution is uh, y is uh, any amount of the first one plus any amount of the second one, as we found so often when we solve these kind of linear problems, that's any amount of e to the m1x plus any amount of e to the m2x. And we're starting to recognize this. We saw these m's coming out. Uh, we saw these kinds of expressions coming out when we looked at eigen um, vectors, eigenvector theory before. Com linear combinations with these exponentials. So, uh, so there we have it. That if, as long as the discriminant of the appropriate uh, auxiliary equation is non-zero, we do get the expected number of solutions, and we pop out all the solutions this way for any um, constants c1 and c2. They're constant combinations of these exponential functions. So that gives us a, an explicit. Uh, collect a explicit solution for a fairly large class of, of valuable and important uh, examples of ordinary differential equations. But we, we should also point out that we, uh, we didn't say, we said this was non-zero. We didn't talk about it being positive or negative. So we could go back and think about what does that mean? What happens if the discriminant is negative? The discriminant's negative, there's a square root of a negative. So we have, are you actually using complex numbers? So even though we have a real problem. We start off at the beginning of this page with a real problem about solving a real differential equation. In the process of solving it, we may be forced to use complex number quantities. That doesn't mean we come up with only complex number solutions. It may be that we can put those solutions together in some so appropriate combination, some linear combination that turns out to be purely real. So we may find that in the middle of the process of the of the calculation, we are ending and we use complex numbers, and we end up with exponentials that involve complex number quantities. But we've already seen before that when you have complex quantities and exponentials, it's possible to write them in terms of cosines and sines, and it may turn out that this ends up being a real answer. So we we start off with a real problem, end up with a real answer, but in the middle of the, of the of the computation, we unavoidably have to work with complex number quantities. So if uh, b squared minus 4ac is less than zero. We get complex um, uh, complex coefficients or complex roots uh, m1, m2. But that's okay. They still work with them, and we try to figure out how to get things to be real. Um, uh, if uh, b squared minus 4ac is positive, then we get real. Uh, real everything, and we don't ever leave the real numbers at all. The whole story works perfectly well. And what if the b squared minus 4ac is 0? Well, we won't worry about that. Um, we'll leave that for another class. Let's see how we do this at the same simple example. So the general theory is to try the exponential functions and just see what happens. Um, we know that if we started with uh, an example like um, y prime prime plus 3y prime minus 10y is 0, um, then uh, we could um, we could write the associated um, the associated uh, auxiliary equation by say, changing y's to m's and derivatives to powers. Um, so 2m's, 1m, no m's equals zero. Note that the, the y's went away. Um, so it's this auxiliary equation, two derivatives of y gives two powers of m, one derivative of y gives one power of m, no derivatives of y gives no m's at all. Um, and then we can factor that into m plus five, m minus two, I hope. Um, and so we get m is minus five and m is two as the two possibilities. And our formula for the final answer was that it's any amount, any constant times e to the minus 5t, this uh, one value of m, and then the other from the other root, e to the 2t. 
So that's the general solution of that differential equation. Okay, so that's how it looks when they're all real. Um, it's very straightforward when all the numbers turn out to be real numbers. A little bit more complicated when they're complex numbers. In the next lecture, we'll go on with the homogeneous theory, explaining what to do when we have complex numbers showing up as roots of the auxiliary equation, and also what to do when we have a repeated root. In other words, the discriminant for the auxiliary equation is zero.